All right, good morning, everybody. So today we are going to um, finish talking about file systems. So there's basically two weeks of class left, which is kind of sad, but um, we're almost done with, with lectures. So um, today we're going to try to wrap up file systems by looking at one more file system design, sort of interesting file system design point that, that we call log structured file systems. Um, for the rest of the week, uh, we'll see what happens. So on Wednesday, I'd like to talk about uh, operating system structure, uh, which we haven't really spoken about yet, but is something that, uh, that I think is interesting and, and brings up some interesting design points. And then uh, we might do some performance analysis and uh, hopefully get to virtualization, which I might move up a little bit this year because it's kind of fun stuff. So, but yeah, so this is kind of the end of like the last big piece, and then there's some just scattered little things that hopefully will be fun. Um, all right, so. Yeah, so if, if you, well, let's see, if, you were on, if you're on track, then hopefully, you know, you're in the final throes of assignment two, just sort of, you know, wrapping up any last little uh, things that are breaking or whatever, submitting patches, you know, looking at the auto grader output. Um, we've decided that we're going to continue recitations through the week that class ends. So the last lecture is two weeks from today on the 29th. Uh, we'll do some exam review at that point. For the rest of the week, Aditya will do exam review and recitation. Uh, we've also decided that we're going to continue office hours until the assignments are due. So we'll have office hours through the 10th, whenever that is. I think that's a Friday. Uh, and just you know, thank thank the TAs for being willing to. And I don't I don't know if this is part of their job description or not, but they've agreed to do it. So uh, so yeah, they'll they'll be here to help and. And I've seen more people in office hours recently, which I assume means that the end of the semester is approaching. People are actually working on stuff, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, everything is due on the 10th. 11.59 PM Eastern Standard Time, mo modulo when I get up on Saturday morning. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, at some point after that point, all of your assignments will mysteriously not be able to be submitted anymore. Uh, so yeah, we'll, well, I'll, we'll see exactly when that happens. But, um, but anyway, yeah, 11.59 is the latest that I will guarantee that you will be able to submit there. All right, so on, on Friday we talked about uh, a fairly old crufty file system design, but something that was nice in terms of sort of being very tailored to the, to the characteristics of, of disk, disks and disk, how disks operate. So any questions about the Unix fast file system? or FFS, any questions about this before I do a little bit of review, right? So, um, so what, you know, what's close on disk? If I want to allocate things close together on disk, what does that mean? Robert? That you want them to be um, in the same, like, physical region of the disk and hopefully on the same track. Yeah, so the same track would be the closest I could get them, right? But but what, what do I really measure closeness by? How much I have to do what? Alyssa? Move the heads, right? Because that's the slow part, right? So really, uh, what I'm more interested in is closeness is, is measured laterally, right? The, the rotational, OK, you know, that, that helps too, especially once I've got the heads to the right place. But what I really care about in spinning disks is this, because this is what's slow, right? Um, and, and this is the major component. And then this rotational, there's this rotational component as well, right? But the, but the seek time is really dumb. Um, so what, did, what were some of these things that FFS did to try to exploit disk geometry? Tim, what was one of them? What's a cylinder group? Yeah, it's essentially all the, all the part, it, it's one part of the disk that I can get to without moving the heads very much. Right, so it's all the tracks on all the platters extending downward through the disk that are close to each other, right? That where I don't have to move the heads too far, right? And what did what did FFS do with cylinder groups, Andrew? Right, I can do that, but how do how does FFS use that to improve disk performance? Yeah, so it's essentially each cylinder group is kind of like what? Pank. 
I've got one big file system. Each cylinder group is almost it has a super block, it has inodes, it has data blocks. What does it start to look like? Wembley. Yeah, like its own little mini file system, right? And, and we saw legacies of this in ext4 as well, right? Uh, so each, each cylinder group is, is stuff that comes from multiple platters. And on, each, and on FFS, each cylinder group has, you know, essentially all of the components of, of a full file system, right? So it's really like I have my own little mini file system. Um, so here's another, we haven't talked about this, but here's a little interesting piece of disk layout uh, errata. So if any of you guys have taken physics at any point in your life, you uh, might be able to answer this question. So let's say that I have this platter, right? And my platter is, is spinning at a fixed rate. Let's say it's spinning at 15,000 RPMs. Where, where would I put the head so that the underlying magnetic substrate is actually moving the fastest underneath the heads? What part of the disk would the would the heads actually be able to read data the fastest? Jeremy? Towards the outside. Towards the outside, right? Think about it. On the outside edge, the track is longer, but it's rotating at the same speed. So modern, on modern disks where they can actually read at full bandwidth from the disk, file systems will actually try to lay out, start by laying out data toward the outer edge of the disk because it's actually faster to read. And what's the other consequence? So because the track is longer, what does that mean? What can I, what can I do? What, can I, what other consequences does that have? It means that the data is spinning faster on the heads, but what else? Yeah. Yeah, that's not what I'm getting at, though, Jeremy. I could store more data, right? So the tracks on the outer edge of the disk actually store more data than the tracks inside just because they're longer, right? Think about it. It's like the, you know, if you've ever seen a, a race on a track, that's why the, some of the runners have to start farther ahead, right? Because they're, they're actually going to travel farther because of the, of the curvature of the track. So what's, what else does that mean, right? So I can read data faster. I can store more data on each track. So what is gonna, that going to help me cut down on? Sean? Uh, Seek times, right? I mean, at some level, seeking is moving from one part of the disk. And the amount of seeking I have to do is determined by the amount of data that's on the disk, right? So if I can get more data on each track, I don't have to seek as far between tracks, potentially, to pick up you know, all of a certain size file. And so the outside of the disk is optimal in a variety of ways for this sort of thing. So modern, modern file systems will actually do this, right? So they'll actually try to pack as much data as they can towards the outer edge of the disk for, for these reasons, right? So it's just another little piece of bizarro disk geometry stuff, right? Um, and you know, we, we saw examples of this going back to FFS, right? So you know, one of the things was FFS had this incredibly gnarly scenario where it could actually compensate for the fact that the disk can't read from full bandwidth by actually sort of uh, jumping over tracks, right? Skipping a few tracks so that, sorry, skipping a few, um, skipping a few blocks on the same track so that the disk read bandwidth matches the bus bandwidth and I don't have to, have to stop and kind of reset all the way around the track, right? And, and again, I mean, to some degree, some of these tricks and you know, really, really sort of low layout, uh, low level layout sort of uh, you know, customizations are gone, right? It really have been lost. Some of them aren't, aren't that useful. But we've seen a bunch of you know, legacies of, of FFS in ext 4 We saw the idea of you know, essentially cylind cylinder groups, right? Um, and we still see some accommodation to disk geometry today when we're laying out on, on big spinning disks. All right, any other questions about FFS before we go? Before we go on. OK, so FFS circa 1982. All right, so now it's 1991. All right, how many people are now born? OK, good, we're doing better. Right? So at least this file system is, is one of your contemporaries. You guys are probably like one year old or something. Um, so who remembers 1991? Right? What's different about 1991 from 1982? Let's see here, right? So, uh, Eye of the Tiger, classic song, 1982. But you know, we've moved on in rock and roll history. Everything that's a terrible song, right? So, really, in terms of music, you can think maybe things are going downhill, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Silence of the Lambs, Gandhi. It's yeah. <laughs> I mean, may maybe this is like a moral decay, right? In '82, we were interested in heroes like Gandhi. In '91, we were interested in serial killers. 
Um, so uh, cannibals, actually, right? So, so that's, that's great. Um, what's different about disks? 1991, Jeremy. They're, they get more dense, like more density. Yeah, they're getting bigger, right? What else are they getting? Or not getting, yeah. They're not getting, they're getting a little bit faster, right? But, you know, they're, they're, you know it's, it's this sort of I.O. crisis that we've talked about, right? This are got, have gotten bigger. They're not getting much faster. Um, but, so, so disk bandwidth is improving, right? Meaning the operating system can stream reads rise to the disk faster, right? And the other big change that's occurring during this time is computers are starting to have more memory, right? So computers in 1991 might have had like 128 megabytes of RAM. Right? It's like, whoa, this, is a, this was like a huge amount, right? Uh, now, now I think like one tab on Firefox consumes that much memory, right? So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that says about, about well, anyway, I use Firefox. So I, I, you guys know I'm embarrassed about that, so I'll just stop talking about it. Um, so, so computers have more memory. Disk bandwidth is improving, right? But what about seek times? Who thinks seek times have improved uh, based on Moore's law during this period? No, seek times are still terrible, right? You know, again, these are, these are physical objects, right? So, so the, the bus speed is improving, right? Remember with, e, with FFS, I was doing, I was, we were just talking about this. I was doing this thing where I was actually skipping blocks on disk because the bus bandwidth wasn't fast enough. Okay, well, that's fixed, right? So we got the bus running faster, right? Uh, we have more memory on the machine. Seek times are still terrible, right? So we're, we're still focused at this point in time on trying to reduce seeks. Okay, but what LFS or long structure file system is going to do is take a kind of a fun and, and fairly counterintuitive approach to how to do this, right? So let's see. So and, and again, so this really comes down to how can we do fewer seeks, right? How can we do fewer seeks? Are there clever tricks to just avoid seeks at all costs, right? Seeks are going to make the disk feel slow. It's going to make the system feel slow. So are there ways to avoid doing seeks, right? Jeremy. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Defra defragmenting back then might have actually made your disk feel faster, right? As opposed to now, where it's just like one of those OCD things that weird people do. Um, all right, so, and then, and then again, so we, 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 we take these two things together, right? So we have all this memory lying around, like 120 megabytes of memory, right? You know, maybe even like 64 megabytes of it isn't free when you're playing, you know, uh, Winter Olympics on Apple II, right? So, um, you know, so could all this memory be useful, right? Can we use it to improve disk performance? So what have we, well, we just talked about this last week, so this is a good review. I mean, what did we do? What was one way that we put spare memory on the system to use? Manish. To improve file system performance. I'm ignoring you, Jeremy. Let's yeah, we used it, right? We used it as a buffer cache. So. We're going to put this buffer cache in front of the file system. We talked about this a week ago, right? This is, this is, you know, this is review, OK? And so with the, but, but then remember, with this cache, right, the cache was more effective at one thing than something else, right? So let's say I've got a big cache, and I let the system warm up, and so a lot of the files that are in use are in the cache. So what, what at this point can I potentially avoid doing entirely. You fill in these sentences, right? With a large cache, we should be able to avoid doing almost any blank. Nick? Reads, right? So, so remember, and, and this is really the, the observation that, that I think led to log structured file systems, right? Which is that caches are great for reads. Right? Caches, you know, once they're warmed up and once, they're, you know, once I bring data into the cache, that cache will essentially sit there and absorb all the reads that I'm doing. Right? And even if I write through the cache, as long as I update the contents of cache when I do writes, I can still absorb future reads to, the, to, to blocks that are hot that are being updated. Right? So disks are great for, uh, caches are great for reads, but I still have to do writes. But one of the observations of LFS was that the cache can help me with writes because what we can do is we can use the cache to sort of gather a bunch of writes together, right? So I can let part of the cache get dirty, right? And then after a period of time or when the blocks are evicted or at some point for consistency, I'm going to flush that out. But now I can do a bunch of writes all at once, right? 
remember we, we talked about this maybe a week ago, the more operations I can give the disk to do it once, the better for the disk and the better for me, right? Because the disk can do better scheduling. So if I tell the disk, here's 10,000 different blocks to write, that's fantastic. Basically, the disk will sort them into some optimal order, and they'll just do one nice pass all the way across the disk, writing all that data that needs to be done, right? So, so the cache can help me with writes a little bit, but it's really helping me just optimize the, the use of the disk, right? So I'm going to soak up some writes in the cache. Reads, I'm going to just assume, hit the hit in the cache, right? I'm going to assume that the cache is my panacea for reads, right? So, so again, so now forget everything that you've learned about file system design, forget about ext4, forget about ext4, forget about FFS. What is the best way to avoid doing seeks when I write to the disk? It's the best way to avoid doing seeks. Frank. Write everything on one track. OK, so that's, that's not a terrible answer, right? Yeah, how about write everything in the same place? OK? Write everything in the same place. Now, it's not exactly the same place, right? But because if you wrote everything in the same place, then you wouldn't have much data left on disk after a while, right? <laughs> um, but I want to write everything to essentially the same place, right? And what these guys did, so this is John Osterhout and, and Mendel Rosenblum, who, in, who invented log structured file systems, is they, is they came up with this nice idea where they said, you know what, let's just write everything to the same place. Right? Not exactly the same place, but essentially the same place. So I keep a log on disk. Right? This is a, you know, how many people have ever seen a log from an application or something? You guys know what logs are, right? A log is essentially a big, long list of things that happened. Right? And all I'm going to do when I do writes is I'm just going to keep appending to this log. I'm never going to seek to anywhere else on disk to do a write. I'm always going to write to the same place. Right? Again, I'm going to keep moving the disk head a little bit right, as the log grows. But essentially, I'm not going to do any seeks when I do writes. I'm just going to keep appending to this log, keep appending to this log. Right? So how does this, how does, how does this actually work? Right? It sounds like a great idea right? if you can pull it off. Okay? So, so let's go back and, and review. So let's say we normally want to, let's say in a normal file system, we want to, I want to modify one byte in a file. All right, what do I need to do in order to do that? What's the first thing I need to do? Josh. I want to modify a byte in a file. What's the first thing? Dan. Yeah, so I need to see, I need to read the inode map. So I need to find where, where, like, where are the data blocks for this file on disk, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the inode map, right? So that's going to require one seek. What's the next thing I'm going to do? Harish. So now I need to read the inode, right? So I found the inode map. So I know where the inode is. Now I need to read the inode to find out where the data blocks are. Now what do I do? Mukta. Yeah, so I'm going to find the data block that I need, and then I'm going to seek to, to, to modify the data block, right? And now what's the last thing I need to do? A little bit of housekeeping here. Sam. Update the inode, right? So uh, maybe I have an updated time on the file or whatever, so I need to update the inode. Right? So, so in this little toy example, right, there are two reads that I'm doing and two writes. Okay? So, and this is how this would look, right? So I seek to somewhere on disk to read the inode map, right? Now I found the inode, so I seek over here to read the inode. Now I find the data block, which is somewhere else, so I'm going to write to that data block, and then I'm going to seek back to write to the inode, right? I wish I would have used this earlier in the semester, right? So, uh, and, and you can imagine, you know, on ext4, this might be one group here, right? And so this might not be perfect. All the inodes might be actually right here, and the data blocks might be right here, but, but who cares, right? I mean, in general, the idea here is that I do one seek, two seeks, three seeks, right? And potentially, I'm, I'm jumping all over the disk, right? So now let's remember that our, our big cache, our big 64 megabyte disk cache, right? So, so I mean, I've, I've been saying this. So why, like, just, just, just to make sure that we're all in 1991 together, right? I, I could have played everything I do, I do it for you. But 
that would have made me throw up in my mouth a little bit, so I didn't do that. Um, but I mean, why is this? Why would like a 64 megabyte cache be so effective in 1991? It's really small. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's part of the answer I want. Yeah. Yeah, the disks weren't that big, right? You might have had like a, I, I don't even know what size disk, but remember, like I'm, I'm in college in 1998, and I think like a 20 GB disk is huge, right? So like the disks weren't that big, right? So, so yeah, I mean, this wasn't a 64 megabyte cache in front of a one terabyte drive, right? That would be terrible, right? The drive, the terabyte drive now probably has a bigger cache than that on disk, right? Like as part of the device. So small disks, right? Fairly small disks, but you know, largish cache, right? So let's assume that our big friendly cache is going to soak up these reads. So now, now what do I need to do, right? So now the nice thing is I still don't have to do these reads, right? So I'm just going to assume that the inode map and the inode for this file are already in the cache, OK? They've been brought in before. And so these reads are going to hit in the cache. I'm not going to have to do any disk operations. But I still end up having to do this seek, right? So even if I assume that the reads are going to soak up, going to be soaked up by the cache, I still have to do these seeks to do writes. Right? And this is where log structured file systems come in. Right? So here's, here's you know, conceptually how an, a log structured file system looks on disk. Right? So this is my disk. This is the start of the disk. This is the end of the disk. These are disk blocks. You can think of it this way. I mean, clearly, like the ordering of disk blocks, if it even maps onto disk location, which we talked a little bit about last time, maybe that wouldn't even be true. But the point is, you can imagine that if this is 0 and this is you know, the largest block on disk, that this sequence of blocks that I'm showing here is a big rectangle, like actually spirals around the disk in some way. Right? It jumps in between tracks and stuff like that. But on some level, it starts on one edge of the disk and it works its way to the other. Right? But that, that 3D representation of what a disk would be like is a little bit difficult to work with on a slide. So this is a rectangle. Um, OK, so and the idea is at some point in time, what I've, what's happened is when I started running my log structured file system, I started with the log, right? And the log started at the beginning of disk. And over time, what I've done is I've just kept appending to the log, right? And we're going to talk about what those appends actually look like, right? And how I can get away with this, OK? So whenever I write to a file in LFS, the current inode and current data block are somewhere in the log, right? Remember, everything that's written on LFS is written to the log. OK, so somewhere in the log is the last copy I wrote of the inode and the last copy of that data block. When I make a modification to these, where do I put the new copies? So I'm going to, this write is going to change both the inode, because I'm going to update the modify time or whatever. It's also going to change the data block, right, because I'm changing a byte in the file, right? So where do I put the updated copies of these structures? It's a log structure file system. Well, yeah, which is right here, right? So this is actually what happens when I, I make this modification in LFS. What LFS will do is it writes the new data block, the updated data block, and the inode to the front of the log. And it just, it just updates the inode so that the inode now links to this data block, right, rather than the one that's in the log. So what does this mean? Jeremy, do you have a question? So that, that could be true, right? But why? Uh, so remember, you have to drink the LFS Kool-Aid for just a minute here, right? Why don't I care about read seek times? Muta. They're going to hit the cache, right? Just pretend I never have to do a read again, right? Like, you are correct, right? And, and one of the things people fought about with LFS, and we'll get to that, that argument a little bit later in the lecture, is do reads still matter? How much do they matter? Yeah, I mean, LFS is giving up a lot about layout with reads to do nice writes, right? Because the idea is that you know, now read the, the data blocks from my file could essentially be anywhere on disk, right? just random locations. Okay? So if, if, I'm a, if I have a read-bound workload, this might work very poorly. But remember, I have a big cache, and I never have to do any reads. Right? I'll just stay in that mode for a minute. Okay, so, but now that I've written these updated inodes and data blocks, what's true about those two old Copies, Jen. Are they valid anymore? No, right? So essentially what, what I'm going to do is these are now free space in my log, right? This, you know, and I need to keep track of this somewhere, right? But the idea is LFS is going to, is going to indicate that these are stale copies, 
right? What, what I would have done normally is I just would have overwritten these with the new data, but that's not how LFS works, right? Because I want to do all the writes to the same place. And so what happens over time is that the log is going to, so over time, what's going to be in the log, right? Imagine I run this all the way to the end. What, what's going to be, my log is going to be a mixture of what and what? AJ. Well, I know it's in data and other disk structures, but let's split them into two bigger, bigger groups. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, some of my log is going to be essentially free space or sort of uh, stale stuff, right? Old copies of inodes that aren't, aren't current anymore, old data blocks that, that aren't correct anymore. You know, maybe other, we'll talk about other data structures that might be in there. And then some of it's still going to be good. Right? So there'll, some of, there'll be pieces of it, like maybe this is the last time I update this file before I get to the end of the log, and so these are still good. Right? Everything else is just you know, stale. Right? And so again, I mean, to some degree, if, if, you, if you buy that reads, I mean, there's two things you have to buy if you're going to buy LFS. Right? There's, there's two things that the LFS salesman has to be able to convince you of. Right? One is that reads don't matter. Right? Reads don't matter, they're handled by the cache. What is the other potential problem with this though, that you guys can see coming? Yeah. What is the log wraps around uh, performance issues? Well, maybe, right? But I mean, the idea is when I get to the end of the disk, I have a problem, right? What's my problem? Sean. Yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the problem is the disk is not full, right? I can't tell the user, sorry, the disk is full, right? Because most of the log is empty space. So now I have to do something about this, right? And, and LFS calls, the, calls this log cleaning. We'll get to it in a minute, right? OK, right. But there are some thorny problems here, right? So the first of all is, the first is, when do I actually do writes, right? So remember, I still want to try to stream as many writes together as possible. Like, I've done a better job with seeks, but it's still better to gather writes into, into the cache. And you know, this, this starts to affect consistency, which is something that we talked about last time, right? But this isn't a huge issue. But essentially, what I do is I try to gather as many read, uh, sorry, writes in the cache as possible and push them out together. Right? And you know, I think the original LFS uh, used to do syncs when the user called you know, sync uh, explicitly or when box were, <laughs> blocks were evicted from the buffer cache itself. Right? But you can imagine doing this at a periodic basis. Right? But there's some, there's some issue about just trying to gather writes together, because the more writes I can amortize. And the nice thing here, too, right, is that remember, um, because I'm writing to the same place, it's even more efficient to gather writes together, right? because I don't have to do all these big seeks. But the idea is that the, the writes may stick together. The other thing that happens um, is, so, so this is another thorny question. right? So how did, who remembers how FFS, how did FFS translate I know numbers to disk blocks? Right? Remember. The file system does not understand names. It just knows about numbers. So on some level, translating a path name meant translating a sequence of characters into a number. Once I had the number, though, how do I find the, the file itself? So on FFS or on ext4, like, you know, I know number is 632. How do I find where that inode is located on disk? Anybody remember? Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, there was some like well-known location where I put my, my inode arrays, right? So ext4 and FFS had these areas on disk that were normally, they tried to co-locate them with data blocks, where I had arrays of inodes, right? And so I mapped the inode number. I could use that to find the array, and then I, I could use that to find the inode itself, right? What about? LFS, how does LFS do this? What do, what do you think LFS does with the inode maps that map inode numbers to the inodes themselves? So it could put them in well-known locations, but then what would, what would it have to do? Sarah? Remember, my goal is to put all the writes in the same place. If I put the inode maps in fixed locations on disk, can I still do all my writes to the same place? Anybody want to? Nick? OK, yeah. So 
if I try to put them in well-known locations, then I still have to see if to do writes, right? Because when I write to the inode map, when I update the inode map, right, then I have to, and when I update inodes, I still have to, to uh, write to some other part of the disk, right? So inodes are just dependent to the log, right, on LFS. So that's, that's the other problem with LFS, right? So let me go back to the picture, right? Let's make this more clear. Um, on, eh, where'd it go? Here we go. Okay. So on our, on ext4, right, the inode map was always in the same place, and all of the inodes were always in the same place, right? So, the, so inode, an inode with a fixed number would never, would always be in the same place on disk, right? Inode number, you know, once you format the file system, inode number three is never going to move. It will always be a specific, you know, 256 bytes or 512 bytes or whatever it is on disk, right? On LFS, on the other hand, these inodes are moving all the time, right? I mean, here was the old inode, right? But then I appended a new one to the front of the log. So every time I modify a file, the inode for that file is going to move. And so I've broken this nice mapping that I was using to find inodes, right? Before I had a number, and then I had to use it to find an inode. Now, but the inodes were always in the same space, so that was easy, OK? Now my inode keeps jumping around, right? Anytime I modify a file, the inode moves. So what do you guys think LFS does about this, right? So I still need some way to map inode numbers to the locations of inodes on disk, right? That's some data structure. Where do you think that data structure gets put every time I modify an inode and the inode location moves? Manish. Yeah, so I definitely have this in memory, but I need it on disk, right? I mean, this has to make its way to disk, otherwise I can't find inodes, right? If I shut the system down and boot it up again, it's like, where are the inodes? I don't know, right? So where, where does this data structure end up being put? Yeah, so it logs the inode, right? So maybe at the front of the log, I don't know exactly how it works, right? But the idea is all on-disk data structures, right, in LFS are also just appended to the log. Right? So any time I modify inodes and I move them around, I have to log the inode map, right? somewhere where LFS knows how to find it, potentially you know, at the beginning of the log or some offset from the log. Right? Um, and all of this other stuff, too. So remember, I had these bitmaps that helped me determine which inodes were in use. Right? Maybe I don't need them anymore in LFS because I don't have these arrays of, of inodes. Right? But essentially, all the file system metadata that we've been talking about that LFS needs is logged. Right? So there was this really this nice, nice consistency to their approach where they said, you know, we're really going to put everything at the front of the law. Right? Anything that gets changed, anything that gets modified, it's going to be locked. Frank, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, does, it create, does it still create inodes on the format? Yeah, that's a good question. So do you think, uh, do you think LF, so, so, it's a, so does LFS have this problem, right? I mean, we, we kind of talked about it as a problem, right? So, Remember with ext4 and other, and other file systems that allocate fixed arrays of inodes, they're limited because they, at format time, they create all the inodes the file system will ever have, and then if they run out, then they run out. Right? Do you think LFS has this problem? Does LFS have fixed size arrays of inodes anywhere? Did I hear a yes? No, I mean, it's just logging stuff, right? So on LFS, eh, where's my thing, right? Yeah. There we go, right? So on LFS, I just have this log, right? So if I create a new file, how, like let's say I create a new file on LFS. Where do I find the inode for the file? On, on FFS, right, I had to find a free inode, right? On LFS, what do I do? What's that? Find uh, that memory, right? What do I need? What, what do I, all, all I need to have to allocate an inode on LFS is what? Just space on disk, right? I just, I'm just going to put it right at the end of the log, right? So yeah, so LFS, because it doesn't have some of these you know, data structures that are created at format time, I don't think has that same limitation, right? It has other problems, right? But it doesn't have that particular one, yeah. Uh, so when you say you're going to append the inodes to the end, does it mean if I have a file with a really big nested directories, like some 15 directories. So mm -hmm. 15 inodes will be updated. So should all those inodes go on uh, be appended at the end of the 
Why would, why, I mean, if you updated all those directories, but why would you have updated them? Uh, if I update the file, the parent directory has to update the inode. The inode location will change. So yeah, yeah, but, but only, the only the parent directory. So when you write the parent inode directory, even the location of the parent inode will change. So well, no, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Remember, what do, what do, uh, yeah. Uh, so what do directories map? Directories map path names to what? Inodes. Inode numbers. Yeah. So if the location of the inode changes, I don't have to change the directory. I just have to change whatever data structure I use to map locations, the numbers to the locations on disk, right? So if I change the inode, so it's a good question, right? The, I, the, the question was, if I update this inode and the inode moves, do I have to update the directory that the inode is located? And the answer is no, right? Because all the directory is going to say is, this is still inode, you know, 635 or whatever. It's just in a different place, right? So the directory will still say, you know, Etsy goes to 635, right? It just means that 635 is now moved, and so the file system has to be able to find it. That's a good question. Any other questions about this? This is a kind of a, kind of a wild and weird, weird approach, right? All right, so let's, <laughs> let's keep talking about it. This is one of those things that's it's just like, it's conceptually very nice until you start to think about it, right? And then it just develops problem after problem, right? Um, all right, so we did this. Problem with locating inodes. Uh, we can log all this stuff. Okay, so now now we have one of the big one of the big issues, right? Which is the log hits the end of the disk. Most of the space in front of it will be what? Weak young. My log has grown to be to to expand to the size of the disk, but most of the disk is what? It's still free, right? It's just you know again it's stale stuff, right? It's stuff that the file system had marked as because it's, it's copies of things that have since been updated, right? So there's usually a lot of unused space earlier in the log. The amount of unused space has to do with the pattern of file system operations, right? So for example, if I'm doing a lot of updates to files, right, especially if they're timed in a certain way so that they, they don't get gathered together by the cache, then I potentially have, like, imagine I just update one byte of a file every minute or something, right? then that data block gets written over and over and over and over and over in my log. By the time I hit the end of the disk, I've got, you know, 80,000 outdated copies of that stupid file, right? It's one of the reasons that LFS tries to do aggressive write caching as well, because it doesn't want that, right? It only doesn't want to write, you know, the, the more um, sort of spur, you know, spurious updates that it does to the disk, the more free space there is in the log, right? So, LFS had this, <clears throat> so again, LFS is, has this like great period of time in which it's just appending to the front of the log and it's not doing very many seeks and like life is beautiful, right? And then you hit the end of the disk. Or, it, and L, LFS actually did this in segments, so it actually broke the disk up into smaller pieces, but you can think about it as just happening in, in one chunk, right? So LFS gets to the end of the disk and suddenly, I had this big chore to do, right? It's almost like, I don't know what a good analogy is. It's like if you never cleaned, and some of you guys do this, I think, probably. So like if you never did laundry for long periods of time, right, and you just like threw dirty clothes into one corner of the room, right, and then pretty soon they're like expanding, expanding, and like you're trapped in a corner, and so it's like, okay, I've got to dig myself out of this situation. I have this huge cleanup job to do, and that's kind of what it, what it is, right? Uh, I mean, if you really like spending several days in a row doing laundry all at once, that's, that's you can do that, right? Um, I don't have that much laundry, so I couldn't get away with that. So, um, so at some point I need to clean, right? And essentially the way LFS cleaning works is, so here's my segment, that segment is some mixture, so the white is free space, I think the red is metadata and the green are data blocks or whatever, so you know, I have this segment, large parts of it are unused, and, and, and one of the reasons why LFS did this in pieces was it's easier to clean one segment into another segment. Right, so imagine I have two halves of the disk. When the first, when the log fills up the first half, what I do is I gather, I compact the log, right? So I gather everything that's alive in the log, and I write it into the beginning of the segment, right? Now this segment is clean, right? So now this segment can be reused, and you know I can keep logging here. So I have a piece of this segment that I can reuse, and then this entire segment is now clean. Nick, did you have a question? It's, yeah, I mean, at some point your disk can still fill up, right? But on LFS, the problem is that, you know, you might get to the end of the log and only have 10% of the log be actually in active use for, for live data, right? So you can't just let, 
the disks fill up with, with you know, junk in the wall, right? Sean. No, no, I mean, that, that, that stuff in the, I mean, that stuff is really, it, you can really think of it as being free, right? It means that I have a more up-to-date copy of that same piece of information, right? So if it's an inode, I have a more up-to-date copy of the inode for that file. If it's a data block, I have a more up-to-date copy. And at some level, so, so actually, I, I think there are some versions of, so what could you do here, right? This is an interesting observation, right? So on some level, that space isn't free. It's actually being used to store old, copies of certain pieces of data associated with the file. So if you were clever, what could you kind of, what might be something that would be straightforward to add to LFS? Yeah, yeah some form of versioning, right? Because that's kind of what LFS is doing already, right? It doesn't overwrite old data. It just keeps writing new versions of things, right? And there, I think there are some versions of LFS that integrate versioning, right? Simply because it almost kind of comes for free. Right? It means that at some point I'm, I'm going to use more of my disk, but versioning always means using more of my disk. Right? I have to I keep, keep old copies of this. Right? But, but I mean, the simplest way to think about it is stuff in the log that's marked as free is, is stale. Right? It means that I don't need that data anymore. And, and that's, that's what's happened here. Right? So you can imagine you know, maybe this is a data block, and there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here, there's a copy here. All those copies are irrelevant at this point, because right? they're not up to date. All right, good questions. Any other questions before we? Go on. Um, and, you know, and it turns out, right, that cleaning is pretty terrible, right? Uh, because, I mean, what does cleaning involve? So I've done all this beautiful work, right, to avoid doing what? Seeks. Now I've got this incredibly seek heavy potentially job. And, and LFS came up with really nice elegantly engineered solutions to make this fast and efficient, but it's still terrible, right? Partly because I've got two segments here, right? Remember that cut and paste that we watched before? That's kind of what's going on here, right? I've got one big chunk of the disk where I've got some crap in it, and then I need to move it to this other chunk of the disk, right? And so, <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I had this beautiful period of time where things were great, and now I have to clean, and yeah, so maybe LFS is like that, I don't know, it's like the brand new disk that feels really fast for five minutes, and then it never felt that fast again, right? Uh, because on some level, at a certain point, I'm always doing this, right? Once my disk starts to get active, I've always got to be doing some cleaning, right? There's always some segment that, I, you know, it's all full of junk, and I've been, I've been trying to ignore it, but now I've got to go in there and clean it up, right? So, um, so you know, LFS tried all sorts of different ways to make this, this problem go away, right? So they said, oh, we can run the cleaner only when the system is idle. Um, but, you know, now you talk about, you know, a, a pretty, pretty high-demand web server. It doesn't idle, right? There's no idle. <laughs> idle means that like you know something else crashed right in front of your in front of your high performance database server or web server right so idle is not a good thing right um, you know there's all these issues about what size of segments right so lar if if I clean big pieces of the disk at once right then that means that I can sort of amortize some of the cost of doing this cleaning um, but sm so small segments so th there's one fairly nice case here. Right? And this actually does happen, right? So in certain cases, depending on the size of my segment, it's possible that all the blocks in the segment are dead, right? And especially if I let, you imagine if I keep logging, right, and then I'm cleaning a couple segments behind where my log is, it's possible that all the blocks in that segment have been updated since that segment was used. And so in that case, cleaning is trivial, right? All I do is I mark it clean and I go on. Right? So, so again, here's another sort of design trade-off. If I make the segments small, cleaning them is potentially very easy because I have this nice corner case that happens more often. If I make the segments big, then it amortizes some of the, the overheads of doing it. Right? Um, and then it, it turns out that um, the other, you know, one of, the, I, I, one of the reasons that LFS file systems seem to have been very popular to argue about is that the cleaner workload is incredibly workload dependent. Right? Sorry, sorry, the cleaner overhead. So on certain workloads, it's like the cleaner is like, I'm done, man. You know, no problem, right? And, and on, some, on some other workloads, it's like the difference between, I, I had some roommates in college who played rugby, right? 
So you know, their, their cleaner overhead was like incredibly high, right? Because they came in with like most of the mud from Cambridge on their clothing. Um, so, so depending on what you do, the cleaner overhead can be either very, very light or very heavy, right? And so when people started trying to debate these systems, you know, there were lots of different ways to, to make log structured file systems look good or look bad, right? And, and depending on the, the point of view people take. Um, and, and then, you know, as, as somebody pointed out before, if the cache doesn't soak up, let's say the cache isn't as effective as we want it to be, right? Well, now I've done, I end up with this really discontiguous block allocation. So what's happened is that I've made this trade-off where I've said I'm really going to try to heavily optimize for writes. If writes don't turn out to be my problem, then I'm in trouble, right? Because I've given up some of the tricks that FFS and, and modern file systems even today use to do better block layout in order to really, really focus on this one issue of writes and seeks associated with writes, OK? So there's some fun, uh, there's, there's, there's a long back and forth about LFS. You probably find like long discussions in like, you know, uh, news groups and stuff like that. The stuff like the, the earlier versions, like this is 4chan 1991 style, right? Um, so then, but there, there, there was, there, people thought about this. So there was this original paper by John Ooster, who wrote in 1991. Um, so Margo Seltzer, who's, uh, who's now at Harvard, but was one of, uh, uh, John Oosterhout's students uh, re-implemented LFS and did some additional performance testing. So at this time, you know, FFS was still around and it was it was you know considered to be kind of state of the art. And so there was this big argument that took place over, you know, FFS versus LFS. And there were multiple you know papers with different workloads and things like this. So you know she, you know, they made some improvements to FFS. Now FFS beats LFS, right? And of course, um, you know, Oosterhout came back and said. You know, oh, you did a terrible job of implementing LFS. So, you know, you guys are, are you know, this is like the, you know, in this community, this is like, oh man, don't don't insult my code hand, right? Um, so, and, and of course, they insulted everything about <laughs> about this, right? Like, you didn't implement it well. You chose bad ben benchmarks, and then you did poor analysis, right? So it's like, there was, <laughs> I mean, maybe all those poor things like gathered together actually like negated each other and, and led to some good analysis, but I don't think that's what he thought. Um, so, and then in 1995, there's a second paper by, by Margo, again, you know, questioning these LFS performance claims, right? And then this is, it starts to get a little bit more nuanced, so it starts to be more about, you know, what kind of workload is good for LFS, um, as opposed to FFS, how much tuning are we willing to do in order to, you know, uh, produce good performance for a particular file system? Nick, do you have a question, or are you? Yep. Well, so it's, it's really interesting, right? Um, I, I think that now, I don't know, maybe a gigabyte or something, you know? Movie, movie files, right? Like high def video, a couple gigs maybe for a, your VM image for this course, you know, a couple. I'm sorry, I wish I had done better with that, but I'll try again next year. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, but, but actually one of the other things that's happened is that file access patterns have changed a lot too, because I would argue that some of those media files have very, very different access patterns. There was a, I, I want to finish up, but there was a study that was done at Harvard on NFS about, I think it was maybe five years after this, right? So they got these NFS traces from the, um, from the campus uh, servers, right? The, the general purpose login servers, that, you know, again, back in the old days, you used to like log into a machine and run this like terminal program to read your email, right? Uh, it was called Pine. I think there's other versions called Elm and stuff like that. It's pretty crafty now, obviously. But um, and what they found, which was really interesting, was that there were these really weird workload characteristics that were the result of email, because people had these huge inboxes, right? I mean, this was before Gmail, but people still did this. They had these huge inboxes with tens of thousands of messages, and those inboxes were stored by the mail clients as one file, right? But all the activity to that file happened at the end, right? So they had these really sort of odd workloads. Anyway. Um, so this goes, so, you know, Oosterhout, of course, comes back, and he's still not happy because, you know, the, the paper doesn't say that LFS is better than, than you know, better than, than, than Wonder Bread or whatever. I don't know. So, so this, this went on, right? So, so this is Margo. Margo uh, actually initiated the creation of this, uh, I, I don't know, this, this wonderful educational operating system that you guys are using for this course. Uh, she taught me operating systems. She's a, she's a wonderful person. Uh, she was involved in this debate. Next time, we will talk about OS structure on Wednesday.
done with file systems. Good luck with your assignments.